Okay, if you've got it, I think the feedback we had before was because I had it open. So I think it was coming through my Facebook. Uh, yeah. But we're now streaming live on Facebook. <laughs> you didn't even, <laughs> such a great host. You didn't even tell me. I, I didn't know. Um, it says the meeting is now live on Facebook. It is. I can see myself now looking very serious. You can see yourself. That's perfect. So I'm not going to start. You know what it was? I think I was playing it through my Zoom, through the, I hit the play button on yeah. the actual streaming. So I shouldn't do that. You know what you could do? You, you, you could go and delete the other one because the other one's still sitting there. What do you mean? You know, the original one that we did that was just. The video sitting there? Yeah, I'm looking at oh, it. Well, I'll delete that after. That's like the bloopers. So anybody who's watching, um, that is the bloopers of Mark and I trying to figure out the tech end of this. Um, our special guest, he you know, jumped in to help me with the tech end. All right, so why are we doing these lives? Um, that is the first question. And this is so I can connect with you guys more often. It's so that I can also give you some free coaching. I can share and update the community on what's coming up and free workshops that are gonna be coming up monthly. So we'll be doing this three times uh, a month with the guest speakers as well as Q&A. And then on the fourth week, we have a free week workshop and we'll get into more about what that workshop is for um, this coming month. Um, all right, I wanna introduce Mark. So Mark, you'll see has a great sense of humor, number one. <laughs> <laughs> so he is the founder of FMA Co uh, Strength Coach, and he loves to travel around the world teaching trainers how to bridge the gap between rehabilitation and strength and conditioning through his unique style of infotainment. Uh, he calls it lecturing meets bad stand-up. I'm mm -hmm. sure you have a little of that today. Um, and he is also the founder of FMA Strength Institute in Australia. He has an annoying habit of laughing at his own jokes. I can totally relate to that. I have the same bad habit. And he was voted the best looking trainer in the world by his wife. And he is into caffeine. He is, it's his drug of choice. And he says he's a caffeine snob. I would have to agree when I've spoken to him. Mm -hmm. All right. So we, he is going to share with us the three tips on how to get out of your own way in your career and in your relationships. And we had a question that was sent in early before uh, we jumped on this live. So we will make sure to get to that question. And um, remember in the future, if you want to send questions in because you can't make the time, go ahead and send those questions in and we'll get those answered in the lives. Cool. Okay, welcome, Mark. I'm so glad you're here. I, I'm actually I'm actually surprised that we're actually streaming live, although I don't know because from what I can see in the Facebook, it looks like it's all frozen. Oh no, are you kidding? Yeah, that, that's sorry guys, even though I was tuning in, I had this very serious look on my face and I'm not normally like that, but it's because I'm watching lots of things trying to go, oh dear, is this working or are not? Are you lying to me? Are you no, kidding with me? I'm, I'm being serious. It's It seems to have been, yeah, it's stuck. Just with the... Uh, closed caption of what's coming up and free workshops. It seems to have gotten stuck. It says we're live. Yeah. So I'll tell you what, let, let's just go with it. Because I could stop the live. It says I could stop the live. Um, but I don't think we want to do that. No. Um, yeah. Let me write a comment to the group. That's a good question because we have um, our tech. I'm gonna I'm gonna refresh the page and see if, if it brings us back. Yeah, because it could be something on your end as well. Yeah. Okay. We want to make sure you don't miss all the goodies. Ah, it's working! Yay! All right. all right, that was um, a moment of little stress yeah. little so everyone stress. thank you for sitting through our mickey mouse operation as we kick off this uh new and improved <laughs> addition to the group <laughs> it will get better I, I promise it will get better our tech person unfortunately wasn't available to help us with a couple of questions that came up um so you've got two monkeys behind the steering wheel trying to steer the ship and it's yeah you're, you're seeing the consequence of that but we'll we'll get we'll get there 
I hope it's entertaining at, at least. Yeah, I'm sure people here can relate to what it's like to try to uh, do that stuff. Especially because this is our first live and much more fun to be had. I mean, not more fun than Mark. Yeah. This is this is why we're starting with Mark. All right. you my serious face is gone and I'm ready to have fun. Okay, let's go. All right. So Mark, let's start with, um, you know, how many of us can relate to really getting our own way in our career or in our relationship? And my question is, how do we start to get out of our own way? Mm -hmm. And when we're feeling pretty shitty, how do we keep showing up for that relationship? How do we keep showing up for our business? How do we keep showing up for our career? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question. And when I work with students, so a lot of the work, as Danielle introduced you to, um, I help a lot of trainers and coaches work in personal training, rehabilitation, things like that. And a big part of what they struggle with is business. So this, this comes up a lot. You know, you've got these coaches who are very passionate about what they do, want to share their gifts with the world, but unfortunately not quite as passionate about making sales and showing up for the business side of things. And we all have these dreams of, you know, what's important to us and, you know, the gifts that we want to give and how we want to serve the world and stuff like that, or serve a partner in a relationship. But there's always the uncomfortable work, the stuff that we have to do behind the scenes that is so important to the success that we, we want to experience, whether it's in business or in relationships and stuff like that. So, yeah, I just call it the uncomfortable work. And one of the, the big challenges is, is if you look at a lot of human nature, right? then you start to realize that at a fundamental level, most of us operate at a basic approach avoidance level. All right, so we talk about approach avoidance behaviors. And that just means if we attach pleasure to something, we tend to want to approach it. If we attach pain to something, then we tend to want to avoid it. So when we go through life, we start to meet this conflict between the two parts of the brain, right? which I refer to as the thinking brain and the feeling brain, right? just for simplicity. So we sit there and we go, you know, I really want something. This, this makes sense. So in terms of the logical reason part of your brain, you go, yeah, it, it makes sense for me to go into business or it, it makes sense for me to lean into this relationship. So there's a part of you, and you hear me say this a lot, a part of you, right? Rather than going, I am, I say, there's a part of you, right? So there's a part of you that likes the idea of something, that likes the idea of being like an entrepreneur and going into business or, you know, stepping out of your comfort zone and, and getting into a relationship and a serious commitment. But then underneath that, Right? If you listen enough, you'll start to experience that there's another part of you, which I said is the, the feeling brain. And that's the part of you that sort of goes, yeah, but. And it has all these little reasons why it doesn't want to approach that. Actually, it's the part of you that wants to avoid that. So a simple way of looking at it, which is a lot of fun, is you know, we've all had that experience, Danielle, where we've gone, you know, I think I maybe should give up coffee for a while. I'm starting to drink too much coffee. I love coffee, but you know, it makes sense that maybe you should, I should cut back and maybe give up coffee for a while or just put whatever, whatever your little advice is, you know, in there, maybe chocolate or sugar or whatever it is that you want to give up. And it makes sense. So in terms of the logical reason part of you go, yeah, based on what I know, it makes sense for me to maybe give up alcohol or give up chocolate or give up coffee, whatever. And the moment you say that, there's another part of you that goes, yeah, but I don't want to. I like coffee. And I like alcohol and I like my chocolate and I like, like, like. And that's the part of you that is going to lean out because unfortunately it's that part of us that we all have, which is the part that's not very good at delaying gratification, right? It wants instant gratification. So we're always split, right? There's a part of us that wants something and there's a part of us that wants us to lean out because of what that gives us, right? So when we look at most vices, quite simply, we're saying, you know, I choose to use say alcohol as a way to feel more good or a way to feel less bad. And if I take that away, what am I left with? I'm left now feeling more bad or, or less good. And I don't want that. All right. So there's a part of us that wants to avoid it. So for me, getting out of your own way is just being aware of the parts of you that want to lean in and approach something and being aware of the parts of you that actually want to lean out and avoid something. And I often use the term self-parenting to sort of navigate this. And it's really interesting, you know, I, I picked up the term self-parenting for my wife, Jimena, she uses that a lot. I think the influence behind that for her was, was um, John, 
Um, John yeah. McMullen, if if if, uh, if you don't know who he's referring to, um, he is an emotional healing coach. He's been doing it how many years? Uh, 40, 40 years. Uh, both Mark and myself have studied with him. Uh, fabulous work. A yeah. Lot of, a lot of inner child work. Yeah. So I, I love that because, you know, now I guess it's like self-parenting where for me that the breakthrough happened when I understood one sort of basic principle around self-parenting. And that is, if you understand what I said before about most of us operate on basic approach avoidance behaviors, right? But when you understand that one of the things that we're all trying to do in this world is to give ourselves our own rite of passage into adulthood, right? So for me, it's to give myself a rite of passage into becoming a man. And for you, giving yourself a rite of passage to becoming a woman. And I look at that as a rite of passage to adulthood is where you start to deal with the consequences of choices in your life. And you deal with the consequences, both positive and negative. So you step out of you know, blaming and shaming and, and all that sort of stuff. And you start to own responsibility because life is all about learning through consequence and owning responsibility for consequence. So for me, self-parenting is such a beautiful understanding or a beautiful term, because when we take on the role and responsibility to be an adult in our life, right? And we look at this basic approach avoidance behavior that we all tend to have, we start to understand, understand something very important. I get so excited. I, I trip up because I want to say so much so quickly. It's okay. It happens to all of us. But you start to understand this very important principle that not everything that feels good is good for us and not everything that feels bad is bad for us. So that really is the difference between the adult versus the child. All right. So we start to look at things now and we start to be aware that there's a part of us that wants to lean out of something that we know is going to add value to our life. All right. And instead of just acting on that feeling, which is what most people do, oh, it feels bad, so I want to avoid it. And then I find ways to distract and delay moving forward, right? You sit with it and you go, okay, I want to meet this part of me. Why is it that I feel this when I think about moving in this direction? What comes up for me? And whatever tool you choose to use, whether it's journaling and things like that to sort of connect with what comes up for you, it's a, it's a great opportunity to start to meet these parts of you that often need healing, all right? Yeah, so I think that what you're saying is one of the tips on how to get out of your own way is to just, first of all, even be aware of these different parts of ourselves that are in com competition with each other. Yes. Right? They're yeah. in competition with each other. And yes, we say we want to be in a relationship or we're in that relationship and now we want to be out of that relationship, right? Because they're competing parts of us because we're always trying to get needs met. And when we feel that we can't get those needs met, it's it it become we either want to lean away or move towards exactly yeah yeah and this is this is to me it, it's so powerful because before i understood this you know i i was guilty of doing what most people do and that is i you know i wouldn't act on what i think i act on how i felt that was a big part so and it was give a an example of that mark so we could you might have just gone to give an example but yeah i mean if i go all the way back it was a it was a, an experience I had with my dad, really, that, that really got me questioning things, that got me thinking about life differently, which led me to understand things like, you know, the way I do now through the influences I've had. But, you know, going back, I must have been about 14, and I'm having a conversation with my dad, and, and he's, he's full on old school patriarch and, and all this, you know, the man is the king of the house, you know, my word is my bond, do as I say, not as I do. You know, all that all that sort of stuff and women were considered to be inferior to men blah 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 like the full patriarch upbringing i had and he was always indoctrinating us into that that view and i was sitting there one day and i was really struggling i was about like I was about 14 and i was chatting to him i said dad i want, I want to talk to you about this and he goes what and i said this idea that you have that men are superior to women but where does that come from and he just goes it's just the way that i am it's, it's how i see things and i was like yeah but why and he goes, what do you mean, why? And he goes, I said, well, I said, do you feel that men are superior to women, like physically? Because if that's the case, because he, he's old school, he used to be a fighter and stuff like that. And I said, you know, I'm doing military training, hand-to-hand -hand combat, you know, with some, some big names in, in New Zealand. And I said, and there are women there that I could bring around here that would kick your ass. So if you're basing it on that as superiority, well, then there's a problem with that. And if you're basing it on, well, superiority around intellect and academia. I said, I can bring women around that were way smarter than you. And I went through a few examples and I was actually really inquiring. Like I said, so, so why do you hold that view? And he just looked at me and he goes, 
look, I know it doesn't make sense. It's just how I feel. And he walked off. And that confused me. I'm like, how can you hold on to a view that doesn't make sense and say, but that's how I feel? Now, at that time, I was too young to understand the difference between thinking and feeling, you know? And as I've come to understand it now, you know, and I really start to understand that there's two parts of self, like the thinking mind, which is the logical and reasonable, and then the feeling mind, which is often illogical and unreasonable. And these are the two parts of self that are often in conflict. And that we start to navigate life um, through a series of conditioning that we've been given that's been programming at the subconscious level. And we just believe these to be true. So for many years, it was a part of me that believed men are superior to women. Now, if you were to say to me, why? I'm like, well, I mean, I can't really explain it. It's just, it's just the way that it is, right? Because that's what I was conditioned to believe growing up. And we hold on to it. So that starts to become a part of how we see ourselves and how we experience ourselves in the world. And then I came across a lot of great work by Maxwell Maltz um, many years ago, um, Psycho-Cybernetics. He talks about you know, the discovery of self-image. And one of his greatest findings was you know, he was looking at a lot of people that, you know, he was a cosmetic surgeon. I think it was back in the 60s, if I remember correctly. And it was around the time where people would get cosmetic surgery, um, not for like cosmetics today, you know, to look beautiful, but to you know, deal with disfigurements and scars and yeah. stuff like that. And he couldn't understand at the time why when someone had a visual disfigurement, say like a scar on the face, that he would do surgery and make them look as if, you know, they didn't have a disfigurement anymore. And some people after a couple of weeks were like, wow, look at me. And they would go out and show up in the world again. You know, they, they felt their confidence came back and all this. Other people would just still hide away as if they still had the disfigurement. And it was like, why, why is that? Because it's no longer there. And what his research showed over the years is that we all have this self-image. And if we try to act in a way that's out of alignment to how we see ourselves, we're always going to resist. And it's right? going to pull us back to how we see ourselves, like a rubber band. Yeah, yeah. So even though, you know, when you think about tying this into what we talked about, even though that lady would look at herself in the mirror who had the scar and now had it removed, in terms of logic and reason, the thinking mind goes, it doesn't make sense for me to still feel disfigured. It's not there anymore, right? But it's such a part of how she sees herself that she still feels as if she's disfigured. So even though you have moved it physically, you haven't removed it emotionally, it's still there. So she acts as if she's still showing this disfigurement to the world, you know? So it's crazy. So when I started to understand this, um, it really helped me understand a lot about my own behaviors and why I did a lot of stuff. I'm like, why did I do that? You know, why did I get triggered by that? Why did I react that way? Oh my God, uh, it's, it's, it's like, it's my yeah. dad. And yeah. I think that's really what you're talking about. We get in our own way, like tip number two, if I were to follow, if, if I'm following yeah. you, is really questioning our own conditioning, questioning yeah. our own belief system so that we can start to catch, are we acting out of, um, our automatic conditioning or are we acting out of who we truly are out of our own value system out of what we believe out of what we've questioned yeah to for us yeah so it's yes yeah, so if we we bring all together so you know the, the first commitment i'd say is you know to start getting out of your own way um you've got to be ready to give yourself your own right of passage into adulthood and mm -hmm. be responsible for your choices and with that it means dealing with the consequences of your choices, both positive and negative. That, that's how we learn. That's how we grow. All right. So we've got to make that commitment. And it's so important. You know, all the years I've been doing this, you know, I'm getting in front of so many like trainers around the world and coaches and stuff. The common thing we have is this like infantilism of, of people right now. It's just these children walking around in adult bodies, but they just don't know how to step into adulthood and take responsibility for their lives. So we always like to start there. So that's the first one. And we start stepping into choices and out of conditioning, which is the second part that we're talking about. And we do that by realizing that whenever we feel discomfort, it's a great opportunity. It's an invitation to, to start looking within and stop looking without. All right. Beautiful. Everybody is externalizing power. All right. So when we look at the average guy, you know, based on evolution and stuff like that, 
we, we tend to externalize these, these symbols of power, which for men, it tends to be the pursuit of things like money, title, status, and things like that. That's what has value to men. And as children, we're taught that everything of value is found outside of us, not found inside of us. So we always have this outward focus and how we experience ourselves is dependent upon how well we're stacking up to what people perceive to be value. You know, all the things that are outside of us. So it's a very disempowered way to, to show up for life, right? Because how you experience yourself is dependent upon what other people are experiencing of you, whether you're doing well or you're not doing well and things like that. So we look at those sorts of symbols for power. Now that comes through our conditioning, right? We're conditioned to go, this is what's important, right? And then that sets us up to go, okay, I'm in, I'm in the pursuit of that. And for women, it tends to be a little bit different. Uh, it tends to be more about, you know, reproductive value, right? Because the woman that's beautiful. And youth. And youth. Yeah. Yes. Youth. Right. So reproductive value is youth. It's attractiveness. Right, because the beautiful woman, the young woman, right, she has power. And I know we all hate to say that this is not fair and all this, but it's just basic tendencies. All right, men tend to be attracted to a certain type of woman, women tend to be attracted to a certain type of men. And when you kind of look at what that is, women are attracted to men that have sort of resource value because there's an advantage to that. And men are attracted to women that tend to have a reproductive value, like youth and, and beauty and things like this. I know it's a very simplified version of it. It is simplified, but I, I, yeah. I understand the point you're trying to make and um, the generality that that usually is wrapped up into. Yeah. So one of the, the important things is, is that as we're, we're going through life trying to figure out what's important, it's always interesting to go, yeah, but who's important to? Right? Is that important to you or is that important to someone else and you're following their dreams or you're following you know, their values? And things like that. So for me, it's always about wanting to know yourself, right? Which is, as I said before, whenever you feel discomfort, it's an invitation to start doing your inner work. It's a step out of for a moment, right? Having an outward focus and start having an inward focus, right? Stop looking outside of yourself and start looking inside of yourself for answers. And this is where it gets challenging for people and scary for people because there's a term we have, which is called, this is where you get to hug the cactus. Right. This is where you get to meet the parts of you. Yeah, hug the cactus, which can be painful. Right? Can you imagine hugging Don't a cactus? Turn around and try it at this moment right behind you. Um, no, it's okay. I've done enough cactus hugging. Right, for all. But it's where you start to, to meet the parts of you that, for want of a better word, are damaged or broken or struggling and things like this. It's a part of us that we tend to hide from. And we tend to hide from the world. So it was interesting. So to put that in perspective, I, I talked about my father and hold, you know, trying to shield these values with me, this conditioning around the patriarch and the superiority of men over women and stuff. And as much as I wanted to reject that, and as much as I said, I am nothing like my father, I do not subscribe to that belief. Um, that's not who I want to be as a man and stuff, right? Unfortunately, if I looked below the surface of those ideas and connected with the message it was very very well ingrained in me as a, as a belief and I had to be over Mark I know that how did that carry over to your marriage because uh, Mark is married to a beautiful amazing conscious um what else will we add about her holistically minded uh queen queen yeah. yes yeah uh yeah. And uh, maybe we'll get her on here sometime too. But um, yeah. in the meantime, um, how did that 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 mentality play in into your marriage? Well, th this was this was really interesting because at a young age, I embarked on doing my inner work and wanting to heal my relationship with myself about myself. And I thought I did a pretty good job. Like the average person. We all think we did a pretty good job until we bump up against our soulmate and they realize. Yeah to us uh the relational dynamics that are uh maybe a little unhealthy yeah and that, that's where I was going to go with that it was I was like so happy so I mean I had my fair share of bad relationships and stuff like that which I hadn't put two and two together I just thought that it's the wrong girl oh, it's the wrong girl I'm not doing like not doing well in love the wrong girl sort of thing 
And, but when it was in terms of my personal development, about myself, in terms of my health and my training and my business and my work ethic, like things were going really well. And it wasn't until I was about 40 that I, I got with my wife. All right. So we met when I was about I know 40. he looks super young, but he is, he's older than 40. <laughs> 50, 51 this year. Look at that. He's and, like 50. Yeah. And I was, you know, I was excited to start this new chapter because. I've always been the type of guy that um, I never wanted to be like the bachelor. I was always happy being in a relationship. So my first relationship I got in when I was a teenager, it was for like four, four to five years. And then my other relationship, I was single for maybe 12 months. And then my next relationship went for like 11 years um, with a girl that had a daughter when I met her. Um, so I became straight, like a stepped into the role of being a father. And I love that. And I still have a beautiful relationship with you know my daughter today. Uh, so I was always someone who wanted to be in a relationship, but they just always never went well. They just started to spiral out of control, which I now get talking to you about the second stage. You know, of the perfect storm. Yeah. And I'm guilty, unfortunately, of just going, okay, I've tried everything. This is not going to work. It's it's time to, to abandon ship, you know, to separate. So that's why a lot of relationships would come and done, or um, they would do the same. They go, this is too hard. You know, this is not what relationships need to be like. And they would leave as well. So it always just, it got to a, a similar point. When I look back now, I can understand how we ended up there um, and set the stage for that to happen, which is hindsight's a great thing. But, you know, I was always sort of content being in a relationship, but I was also at this point, like 30, when the last one quit, I said, I'm done. I'm, I'm not going to get in a relationship again. I'm going to be single now. I've, I've given up on that idea. And I spent 10 years being single. So I met my wife at the age of 40. And this was a challenge, you know, because when I met her, it was one of those moments where you just know, you just see someone and it just takes your breath away. And you just think, I, I, I need to know more about this person. There's, there's something about this person that I haven't had, you know, the feeling again um, with, with anyone really. So we got married. Really that familiarity is um, our early childhood wounds align quite nicely and it feels very familiar. Yeah. yeah I don't need to be a damper on the situation. <laughs> no, no. Like what, what seemed like a, a magical moment, I now realize, as you said, was just just the warning. It was just the calm before the storm. <laughs> that good feeling before the chaos. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, you know, it's it was crazy. We, we met at a, a conference. I, I was presenting at this conference in San Diego and she was there attending. And we probably spoke once for like about 10 minutes at the, at the conference. And that was enough for me to get her information and send her a, a, a message on Facebook to chat to her. We jumped on Skype. So she was living in Miami. I'm in New Zealand. We spoke on Skype maybe once or twice a week for about two months. And then she packed up her life and told everyone that she was going to marry me. And she flew over to be with me in Australia. And we've, we've been together ever since. Now, on the outside looking, and that sounds like a pretty cool story. Crazy story. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a pretty cool story. But in reality, what happened after that was just terrible, like terrible from, from the outset. And I did probably more healing in the first couple of years with her than I ever did on my own. And that was the beauty of a relationship. Like when you get that right partner, they are fantastic at rubbing your wounds. And that's exactly what I was going to say. When we say right partner, it doesn't mean that it's all roses and um, and sunshines, right? Yeah. It, 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 you have to be a warrior or a warrioress because, yeah. because there's going to be trigger and then behavior, and then that's going to trigger your partner, and then they're going to act out of behavior. And I would be curious as to see what some of those dynamics were between you when you said it was some of the hardest work you've ever done. Yeah, well, I mean, partly is because... The, the big reality I had was how much damage I had when it came to relationships and intimacy. I won't bore everyone with my, my timeline of the trauma I'd collected along the way, but it left me um, not trusting women, not respecting women, um, and also wanting to manipulate and control women, right? That was how I owned the illusion that I was enough by making fe women feel like they weren't enough. Now, I can see it now, but at the time, I, I didn't know I was doing that. It was just part of my, my behavior to, to do that. 
So you were yeah. pain and you were be acting out of that pain in those behaviors, manipulation, control. Yeah. So my, my big thing, and it, it's horrible, but you know, my big thing was to get with very attractive girls and then make them feel like they were nothing being with me. Right. And that's just by having a way of just slowly just eroding their confidence in themselves and how they experience themselves around me that it would then shift the tides to put me in a position of superiority and then a position and of power. Inferior. Yeah. A false sense of power, right? Yeah, it was how I act at control gun. Like I said, it was how I found the illusion that I was enough to cover up the fact that I felt like I wasn't enough in, in relationship because I've been hurt by women in the past. So this was it. So when Hemi came over, um, she got to meet that side of me in full force. So she comes in and she's- We're still in the honeymoon phase. And things but, were no, we we had no honeymoon face. Wait, but what about the phone calls prior to her coming over? That that was the deception phase. Well, you can call it that, but <laughs> <laughs> it's the rose-colored glasses, right? You you because I remember too, you sharing with me if it's okay early on, you were pretty quick to get married, meaning you had proposed oh. like four months in, I believe. Yeah, we we were we were like I said we she flew over after two months, and then we got married in the next couple of months. A year is about four months. It was all it was all done. Yeah, and it just began, and that is where the work started. Yeah, yeah. So there, there was there was absolutely there was no honeymoon period. I never went through a period of from that initial seeing her like I like this. It was this conflict in me of wanting her but not wanting her. Like I go through, right? So and that she, we call that anxious attachment. Like you come and then you go, and you come and you go. So there's yeah. this rubber banding back and forth, and 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 a woman that would be attractive it probably grew up, and that's which how she also potentially experienced love growing up, right? So that's yeah. how you experienced love growing up. It was just enough, but not enough. Just enough, not enough. Yeah, it was. Is that fair for me to say? Yeah, yeah, it is. And it was, I guess, you know, like I told you that I had this, um, it was all about control drama. So one of the things I used to do is I was very quick at reading what people's weaknesses were, their wounds, right? So I picked up very early that Hemi had her wounds as well, right? So she'd come out of a, a, a failed marriage um, and there's a few challenges going on for her. But her thing was, is that she needed to use like a, like flirtation and her body and stuff to get attention. That that was her thing. That's how she'd draw men in to get attention. And I picked up on that very quick. So what did I do? I, I withdrew attention. And that's how I made her feel like she wasn't enough. And unfortunately, over the months of me withdrawing attention from her and not even looking at her and, and showing attraction to her and stuff like that, it really damaged her, which I hate to say, you know, in terms of the experience of being with me and how she experienced herself, that she started to doubt her own beauty and her own confidence and, and all this sort of stuff. And we we went into a really yeah, dark yeah, I really appreciate that differentiation moment where Mark jumped in and said, you know, I can't really speak for her, hmm. but based on what I, how I experienced it, that was beautifully done, Mark. I just want to stop you mid sentence because of that. It was a beautiful moment of you taking your ownership back that you can't, you can't think, feel, or do that for her, but that that's your experience of her yeah and it was it was a horrible time and we just sat and we just like we, we knew there was a connection there there was, there was a there was a reason why we got brought together and we couldn't believe it was just for that for her to come over for me to treat her this badly and for her to pack up and go so we, we sat and we really talked about it. and one of the things I really loved about him was She's, she never put pressure on me to be anything other than what I was. So she would always invite me. So she would say something like, look, if you really don't want this relationship, it's okay. And I'm, I'm happy to leave, right? But if you do want this relationship, right? These are the behaviors that are not acceptable to me and I can't be around. So you need to choose what you want. If you want those behaviors, then I'm going to have to leave. Or if you want me, then we can talk about a different way of being in a relationship together. And it used to piss me off. Like, because I've never had a girl ever. What part of that pissed you off? It, yeah, I say, because I've never had a girl. It was just so much easier when a girl would just get angry with me. And I could just go, yeah, well, fine, go. <laughs> you know, like, 
like that. She really, she was calling you to the plate and you had to show up. Yeah, she you, was you could show me. up or not show up. Yeah, right? she was inviting me to, to grow up and make a choice and then be prepared for the consequence. And I didn't like that because no one likes consequence. Right? Consequence is too real. We just like to deceive ourselves and blame other people and go, oh, well, that didn't work. I'm just unlucky in love or you know, blah, 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 and, and sort of project onto the other person. So it was really annoying because it got me to sit with myself going, I, I need to make a choice because I cared about her enough not to want to hurt her. Because like I said, I was never intentionally, you know, doing these things. It's not like I'm a horrible person. I go, okay, cool. Let's get her over here. And let's see how quick we can destroy her. You know, that was never the plan. It's not malicious either. And I, I think what you're sharing in between the lines is you made a choice to recommit to your relationship. And in doing that and recommitting, you made the choice to then go deeper within yourself and as a relationship, go deeper. Yeah, yeah. And it was interesting because I know where you know, people who listen to this, we're all going to be in different stages. And I'm sure some people might be at the stage that I'm talking about now. And like I said, it, it's sometimes very frustrating when somebody actually treats you with grace when you're acting out and they're still acting for you. It's it's very frustrating because you can't blame them. You can't get angry with them, but you want to blame someone. So the only thing left to do is you're forced to start looking inside yourself and go, what the fuck is going on? Like, And that was where I use the term, you know, having to hug the cactus because I had to meet the part of me that I had to eventually reintegrate. And it's like, you know, hugging that broken part, so hugging the cactus because it hurts. You know, it, it's it's like wow. So being with Himmy, it was a a roller coaster ride of just going deeper and deeper into myself. And remember at the start of this, I said, you know, when you feel uncomfortable, that's a great opportunity to go, hmm, what is it that I need to look at? All right? Because everything I did with Himmy was based on that. Something would happen and I would feel pain. I would get triggered. I would be upset. And rather than externalizing it and go, I feel triggered you're wrong, you're bad. I'd go, oh, here we go again. Why did that just trigger me? <laughs> this is what it was like. Well, yes, yes. Yeah. You started to look inward and then be able to communicate that as you got clarity with yourself, with your partner. Yeah, and so I would just keep going inside myself. And if anyone else listen, guys, it's it's a tough ride. It, it really is. Because we, we like to deceive ourselves that we're doing okay. You know, and a lot of us, and I was guilty of this, we, we would do you know, self-development courses and read self-development books and stuff like that. And that was just really just to own the illusion that we're doing something when we're not really doing anything. Because nothing really changes until we actually start to act on what we're learning and we start to do the uncomfortable work. So I used to hide behind reading lots of books and watching lots of courses and go, oh, yeah, this all makes sense. So intellectually, I knew a lot, but emotionally, I hadn't done anything with it. And that's where practices are so important and exercises is it's, it's not just about knowing it, but it's having the right tools and skills and practicing them over and over and over and over again, just yeah. like in any career, right. That you excel at. It's like, you have to keep practicing. The relationship is the same thing. You have to keep practicing, working together, practicing the tools together. Um, yeah. And one of the tools that I, I know that you did want to speak today about was a really want I would say that was a pivotal 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 yes I got it out a pivotal um pivotal. <laughs> <laughs> um in your own relationship you know what tool I'm talking about are you calling me a tool <laughs> I was a tool well, that's, that's offline that's offline let me used to say that she used to say I was a tool in this relationship as well she uh, did no, no, no I, really. I don't see her saying that no. so you're talking about the fighting fear yeah wasn't that a pivotal tool you know a pivotal tool for you as a couple not just the inner work and healing the inner child and integrating the inner child in the parts of us but mm -hmm. it was also a important tool for really saving the relationship, the the entity that existed between the two of you that were, you, you know what I'm saying? It's not just Penny and Mark, but it's also the relationship, which is a yeah. third part of the triangle. Yeah, I mean, I think when you, when you look at it, 
Like we all we all understand how important conversation is, how important it is to talk. And it's interesting that no one ever teaches you how to talk to yourself. That's the first thing. So when you look at the way most people talk to themselves, it's really negative. It's it's very critical. It's very, you know, like it's not nice when you, you sort of dial into someone's self-talk. So, you know, we need to look at how we talk to ourselves, which is very important. You got to learn how to do that and how to talk to others. Now, it was interesting because at school, we would talk about, you know, how to have conversations like business conversations, how to talk to others and how to talk to your superiors and all this. But we never taught about how to talk to a significant other, like a partner. Yeah. Right? So my whole upbringing was conversations that at, at the heart of it was always based on some perceived hierarchical structure. Like I'm talking to someone who's either more significant or less significant than me based on hierarchy. So like at school, if I'm talking to my teacher or my headmaster, right, they're higher up in the hierarchy. So I had to talk a certain way. I had to show respect, right? Now, I believe that, you know, there's a lot of problems with that. But yeah, we won't go into that. But it was always based on that. When I had to talk to my mum and dad, it was I had to address them a certain way. They could talk to me a certain way. I talked a certain way because they were higher up on the hierarchy. So everything to me was was about jousting for position of, of hierarchy. So mm -hmm. when I get into a relationship, it was always about how do I position myself in the superior role and make them more inferior, right? Just so I would be able to control the, the conversation, the friendship, the relationship. It was always about control. And again, you know, if we strip it back to ego, we often say that ego is really concerned with, you know, competing, comparing, um, and controlling the three C's. And that's how I was coming at life, right? I was coming at every relationship. It worked control. well for business. Yeah, but it doesn't well, work well. It doesn't work well for a relationship. Yeah, so then I, I get into this relationship now where I'm told that it's based on equality, that we are equal, that we're partnerships. And it was like, yeah, I like the idea, but I didn't really feel like it was true. Going back to the start with patriarchy, you know, the, the way I was indoctrinated into that. Right. So, I mean, do I agree with the idea that men and women are equal? Yeah, I do. I, I, I believe that. A part of me believes that. Is that how I feel at a deep level? Not really, because you put me in a room with a woman or you put me in a room with a guy, my ego is always going to be jousting to control that relationship and, and be the dominant person. That's just a part of what I am and how I know to navigate the world. So I get into this relationship with Hemi um, and, you know, on the surface of it, I say, yeah, I, I agree, we're equal, but I start acting out control dramas to position myself as the authority in the relationship. Now, not as blatant as my dad was, like I didn't just come out with it and go, you know, I'm the king of this castle, you do as I say, not as I do, and all that sort of crap. Right. But at an energetic level, um, Hemi was always left feeling that she was subordinate to me. Now, I wasn't overtly doing it, but you know how important energy is, the energy that you bring to a relationship. I mean, most of our communication- Well, this was on a subconscious level until it became conscious for you. And still, yeah. you, until you started doing your inner work and realized, and the inner work goes on forever because we always are discovering new parts of ourselves. But, yep. uh, you know, I think that that's when, he, so as Mark is talking, he's not talking about that this was conscious for him and he was trying to make- Hemi feel like shit. Um, that wasn't the the, the idea. But the idea is is that subconsciously this was running in the background underneath the surface because of his conditioning. Yeah. So when we started to do work together to you know do our healing together, Hemi had a way of shining the light onto these dark aspects of myself that I wasn't really aware of, and if we full circle this all the way back to the start where I said, you know, I didn't want to be anything like my dad, right? The, the biggest moment of, oh my God, was like I said, shortly you know, in my forties getting with him, when I realized, fuck, so much of my relationship behaviors are driven through my, my dad ego. Seriously, I, it was a shock. That's why we say hugging the cactus. It was like, oh my God, I've been telling myself this story for all these years. I was nothing like my dad, but I'm completely like him. And when it comes to relationships, the way that I act towards women is in complete conflict to how I think about women. And that's why I, I didn't get the disconnect. Like I just couldn't see it. But now I get why, because at a deep level, all that 
conditioning made up how I identified with myself in relationship to women. And I, I'd play out those behaviors. I was just like my dad. I was, it was like I was a different person when I got into a relationship with a girl. And it was, it was crazy. So I had to really meet that part of me and go into that and start to unravel the mess that I'd been carrying into every relationship that ultimately um, was going to end this relationship as well with him. Because there was no way until I healed these parts of myself that were showing up, you know, with these stories about who I am in relationship to women, until I got out in front of that and resolved that and healed that, every relationship was destined to, to fail. Destined and, and, to that, and it was destined to show up with the same kind of woman who had the similar uh, wounds. Sorry about that. Uh, my, my alarm for the next appointment. Um, with, this, with similar wounds, mm -hmm. right? Yep. That would trigger you to then act out those behaviors. Yeah. And you know what's crazy about it? It's, it's we, we talk about throwaway behaviors. So, you know, if you go back and I said, you know, we have this self-image, this idea of self. And if we act out of alignment to how we see ourselves, we want to resist it, all right? So it's interesting because then it leads into the next thing, which is, okay, you, you start doing some work on yourself and things start to go better. And you go, oh, this is cool. Like things are going well. But then you start to realize that that starts to feel uncomfortable. Things going well, a, a good relationship. This doesn't feel right. And then we start to act out throwaway behaviors where we do things to sabotage it, to bring us back to our set point of conflict and chaos. So I found myself- In our havingness, our ability to have more and be more. Yeah. So I had to then meet this part of me that every time our relationship started to get better, I would do something to sabotage it, to spiral us back down to where I go, ah, this is where I feel comfortable again in, in this level of conflict. And that was another crazy- right. yeah. That's a really important point you make, Mark, because we, because it's often when we get into romantic uh, relationships, it triggers our attachment styles. And mm -hmm. then we are also the level of chaos that we might've grown up in our families. We recreate that subconsciously based out of our attachment systems. Yeah, so it's been an ongoing um, journey like that. And I'm happy to say we, we've been together now for 10 years, just over 10 years. And it's it's been very, how should I put it? It's one of those, those experiences you go through where you go, I wouldn't change it, but fuck, I don't want to do it again. <laughs> it's one of, one of those. Say that again. I wouldn't change it because of all the things you learned and grew from yeah. individuals and as a relationship. And I would do it again. No, I wouldn't do it again. Oh, I wouldn't do it again. Okay. It's one of those experiences where you go, I wouldn't change it if I could. Right? Like it was, I'm glad it happened, but I don't even want to have to do that again. It was, it, it, it's challenging. It's like being a warrior. Oh, it is. It's so exhausting. It is. It, it takes a lot of courage, um, not just on behalf of the person doing the healing, but also the partner as well to stand by you during, during that, because it really is. It's, it's like it's, <laughs> some parts of it's like an exorcism where you're purging stuff. <laughs> you just didn't you didn't levitate though um no but i got close to it like seriously like it was you really i mean you you had mentioned to me and just and i know we need to wrap up here quickly but not that i want to i this is such a good conversation um and you're a phenomenal speaker. And I love the analogies. And even in the comments, people are like, I love the prickly cactus analogy. So I wanted to give you that feedback. Um, and people are really enjoying this conversation. So uh, one of the things that really helped you and Hemi was the fighting fairly yeah. and really being able to fight fair um, in your relationship. And that is the pivotal, um, I think, tool for you guys, at least based on our conversations offline. Yeah. Yeah, so it was interesting because we take a couple of steps back and I was leading into um, how I didn't know how to talk to myself or how to talk to others and you know, the whole hierarchy structure. And then I'm in a relationship with someone where there's meant to be this equal, 
equal exchange. But in my world, we're not equal. You're, you're subordinate to me. So I control things. So that would come across every time we had conflict. So when I wasn't triggered, you know, I, I would come across as, you know, yeah, we're equal and blah, 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 we're a partnership and all that. But the moment I got triggered, right, my, my dad ego would pop his little ugly head out and would start shouting through my mouth for me. And the stuff would come out that was just so condescending, so dismissive, anything to regain the sense of power, right? The control like this. And we were just getting nowhere fast because Himmy, she's quite a strong woman as well. And she what, wouldn't- What threatened you in that moment? What about her behavior was triggering for you to start yelling? It was when I felt that um, she wasn't listening to me or- You're feeling heard. Yeah, I wasn't feeling heard um, or just- email ego stuff where I feel like, you know, I should have the final say on this and she wouldn't accept the final say. So you weren't uh, feeling understood. It, it was, it was crazy. It was, again, it was my wounds. So if I said, okay, this is what we're going to do. And she disagreed with that. I felt disrespected because a subordinate doesn't question. Right. A subordinate, right. Yeah. Doesn't second guess. So you like felt that. disrespected. You felt like you your your opinions weren't being valued in those moments or your beliefs or your understanding of the world. Yeah. And because I had a very sort of violent upbringing and it was very about, you know, about the masculine. I mean, I was watching a funny skit the other day, which explains it so well. And the guy comes in, he goes, they're, they're like, oh, here's the stand up. Just no, there, everybody. Not, it's not stand up. It's actually just it was a funny little video I saw, which explains it so well. This, this is me to a T. Right. So he's, it's about these tech guys. They work in a computer store, right? It's a New Zealand comedy. So the manager, he's, um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen The Office, you know, that series, The Office. Okay. He's a lot like him. He thinks he's really cool, but he's not, you know, yeah. and he, he thinks he's a motivator of people, but he's not, all that sort of stuff. So he's walking out and he goes to his mate who's behind the counter. He goes, Do you want a coffee? He goes, I'm going out for a coffee. Do you want a coffee? And he goes, Oh, that'd be great. I'd, I'd love one. Thanks. He goes, cool. And he walks off. Anyway, he comes back 10 minutes later and he's got no coffee for him. And the guy goes, did you not give me a coffee? And he goes, no. And he goes, but, but you offered. He goes, I never offered. When, when did I offer you a coffee? And he goes, you said, would you like a coffee? And he goes, yeah, I was just curious if you wanted one. I never said I was going to buy you one. That's being a bit assumptive of you, don't you think? Like this. And just starts belittling him. So eventually the, the young guy goes, because he normally cowers away. He gets bullied all the time. He goes, no, this time I'm, I'm not. And he goes, no, what you did was a dick move, right? It's universally accepted. If you say, do you want a coffee? It means you're going to get a coffee. And the, the guy starts trying to argue back. He goes, I'll give you one chance to shut your mouth like this. This is the control stuff. He goes, no, I'm not going to be quiet this time. What you did was wrong. And he goes, I'm warning you, stop it. And he goes, no, you did a dick move. And he starts telling him off. And the guy starts going, um, um, and emotionally, he started to lose the control. Like he's going, I, I don't know what to say here. So he goes, uh, he goes, I'm going to hit you now. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I like it. That's so me. That's how I would show up for a relationship. I'd first try to get control. If I couldn't get control. You wouldn't hit her though. No, no, no. But with. I just want to clarify to the audience. Mark was not physically abusive to his no, wife. <laughs> no, but that, that's how emotionally childish I was. Yes. Like if I had a, if I had a disagreement with someone and I couldn't win, I'd be like, I want to hit you now. <laughs> it was like a little kid sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah. So I'd get into relationship, like discussions with Himmy. We would start to disagree. I'd be like that character who would step up and go, I'm telling you to stop now, right? The conversation's over. And I'd try to be him like the, blah, blah, you, no, no, you stop like this. And she wouldn't stop <laughs> like that. And I'd be like, like this. she's a strong personality too. So, you know, it, it, some of you know his wife, but some of you don't. But she has a strong personality. She probably wasn't going to take that shit. No, not, not at all. <laughs> and I would get so frustrated. And like, even to the point, like sometimes I, back in the days, I, I would throw things. Like I'd have to, because, you know, I don't, I'm not going to hit her. But this well, thank God. anger comes up. Yeah. And it's like, uh... like this, or I'd have to slam a door. Or I'd have to do something to give like a physical outlet to it. And it was just like, this is not working. This is really not because it was just, I just didn't have the emotional maturity to deal with a relationship that was actually based on two people being equal in the relationship. I just didn't know how to do that. 
All right. So like I said, I was good at facading when I was okay, but when I got triggered, the facade would drop and I just didn't have the tools to deal with it. So that because that's often what happens because the higher we are in the red zone, yeah. the, we don't have capacity of our full brain, our full critical thinking. So we're just reverting to, to behaviors that we know, right? Yeah. And that was your behavior that the behaviors that you knew or the, the conditioning that you knew. Yeah. So fighting fear for me was a concept that I never understood because in my world, there was no such thing as fighting fear sort of thing. I, I wasn't taught it. So now we've got to learn what, what fighting fear was. And it, it was, it was interesting because again, you start to see <laughs> like when, when you sit down and you discuss something and you start having empathy for the other person where you step out of yourself and you step into them to see how they see things, how they're experiencing certain behaviors. Again, that that's a shock. Like, think, Mark, in all honesty, that's a very advanced, um, when we're looking at an empathy scale as a coach, a relationship and couples coach, I go through the, the different stages as we grow towards that. That's a pretty advanced skill. So what he's talking about, we don't just jump to that. That, that is developed over time. Um, but yeah. I just wanted to insert that in there. Yeah. And when you start seeing like how your behaviors are impacting someone else, it's, it's sometimes it's a pretty tough pill to swallow. You know, I used to joke with students and go, you know, we all sit here, you know, talking about how, how much people have harmed us and hurt us, you know, in relationships and all that. And I said, you know, one day I've wondered, I wonder how many people have had to seek out you know, counseling because they met me <laughs> like that. You know, how many people have I really hurt? It's it, when you sort of think about things differently, it's it's quite crazy. And but, how many people did you help grow, even if you hurt yeah. them? Right. Yeah. So yeah. that's another aspect of it is they bumped up against you too because you carried the energy. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. Right. So, so, so fighting fear. Oh, do you want me to still go about fighting fear? I, I would love for you to talk about fighting fear. And I, before we wrap up here, I do have one question from that uh, somebody sent in earlier that I'd love to. So share. we can do another, another live and we can talk oh. about going into all that stuff. I think I would love it. One yeah, I think about fighting fear and then we'll jump in the question and then we'll bring Mark back okay. because he's so well loved here. Uh, so with <laughs> fighting fear, um, it's, it's really challenging to start with because it really is the uncomfortable work and as, as danielle said before the whole key to fighting fear is to get in before you get triggered because if you get triggered and you start to go up a notch like that it it becomes harder and harder and harder to talk yourself back down so for me the first step was timeouts because i, I wasn't yeah, I wasn't there yet. I wasn't able to be aware of myself enough in a bit of an exchange with Himmy to go, oh, I'm starting to get triggered and I need to da da da. It was just like, no, because I was so used to going from zero to 100. Okay, I'm triggered now. <laughs> like that, that's how it would be. So, I'm out. Yeah, it's like, okay, I'm triggered now. Um, I need a timeout. <laughs> that's what it was like. Because I, I couldn't do anything because I knew that I just was not in a space to talk about anything that's going to make any sense other than defaulting to, I need to try to criticize you or put you down or do something to own the illusion that I'm controlled by making you feel like you're out of control. So it was just, the first step for me was just to go, I need a timeout. And I would, would leave like that. But as Hemi soon picked up, that part of me that wanted to avoid the uncomfortable work, right? that cunning part of me, sort of figured out, hey, this is a nice sort of get out of jail free car. You know, him would be like, right, we need to talk about something. I need a timeout. And I just walk off. <laughs> Not quite that bad. I hope but... it wasn't that bad. Oh. But in, in timeout also, just for everybody listening, um, I, and Mark probably did this, I suspect, is when he said a timeout, he also gave her a time of when he was returning. Uh, the brain loves predictability. So when we tell our partner timeout, it's also letting them know when we're going to go back into the game. Yeah, which is what I didn't do at the start, by the way. Oh, okay. Thank you for your honesty. It, it was just, I want to time out and I would use that as a way to avoid the issue like that. All right. And then, of course, 
that got picked up on. And I just felt like, you know, it, it's funny because at the start of this, I talked about this rite of passage in, into being a you know, manhood. Yes. And I had to realize how much of my behavior was childish. And I, even then it was like, oh my God, even with this, I'm acting like a freaking child, like a sport little kid. Like mm. I just run away from the uncomfortable work. I was, and I realized, well, there's such a part of me that has got so good that if I can't control someone else, I find ways to get away from them, to fly like that. And I was doing that all the time. So then I had to meet that part of me, which meant I then had to like, you know, pull up my big boy pants and go, okay, I need a timeout because I did need a timeout. But then it was like, okay, but give me 10 minutes and then we'll sit back down again and, and we'll pick this up. Give me a moment to just meet this part of me that's feeling really uncomfortable and triggered so I can become aware of what's coming up for me. And then how about we talk about what came up for me when I got triggered versus trying to push forward with the problem. And to me, that, that was the big key because now we started to support each other. Like I would get triggered and then I'd come back and we'd talk about what came up for me. And there was a lot of value in that because it no longer became about what we were going to discuss before. It was like, okay, you just stumbled, right? I'm here to help pick you up, you know, dust you off so we can walk forward together again. And that, that was beautiful. It made me feel um, safe to start talking about the stuff that was coming up for me. All right. And the same thing for him. She would get triggered as well. And we'd, we'd, I'd hold space for her and she'd talk about what came up. And what happened is as we did that more, the, the need for apologizing went away as well. And what I mean by that was, let's say that Hemi got triggered and had like a little bit of an outburst and got really upset with me and, and some of like that. And then she'll sit with herself and then she'll come back and she might say, hey, look, I just want to apologize um, for the way that I just spoke to you. It, it get to a point where I just sort of smile and go, I appreciate that. But you know what? At the end of the day, you've got your stuff you're working through. I've got stuff I'm working through. And we're just human. And we're going to have these moments where we stumble and fall. But we're in this together. So we don't need to apologize because, you know, I know that I'm going to probably fuck up way more than what you do. Right. And you hold space for me and I'm going to hold space for you. And that's what this means for us to grow together like that. So we give ourselves, yeah. So, so we just gave ourselves permission to not be perfect. Uh, and we sort of said, and we gave us permission to not take everything so personally. So that was another big thing. It was like, um, even if I had a bit of an outburst, Hemi wouldn't take it personally. If yeah. Hemi had a bit of an outburst, I wouldn't take it personally. It was just like, wow, you know, something just came up for you, you know? And when you're you to realize you each had triggers, right? You yeah. each wounds and because you also open the conversation up to be able to talk about it and really listen from that other person's perspective and vice versa you were able to start to build some trust and safety in your relationship where somebody wasn't coming in there to rescue um the other person right but you were able to be with with each other and work through and come together as a team and not fighting each other, but being able to really attune to each other. You're, and what what was happening internally? Is that fair for me to say? Yeah, it, it is. It really is. And I think the one thing I'll say to people before we wrap this up, because I know you've got to go, it's, it's really interesting because you start to realize as you go through that process that the other person really isn't the enemy. Correct. You know, and I know that sounds silly. Like for most people, of course, she's not the enemy, but it's amazing oh, how we our partners as opponents. Yeah, sometimes when we are trying to, uh, instead of uh, treating the problem as the opponent and coming together against the problem, I think that's what you're. Yeah, and I, I look at it. I mean, there was many years like I I did boxing. It's always used sports analogies and stuff like that. But you know when you get in the ring to spar with someone, right? That person isn't getting in the ring because they want to hurt you. They're getting in the ring to spar with you because they want you to become the best you can be. So they're actually in the ring, not fighting against you, but they're fighting with you, for you like that. And I get that because that's why the coach would always team me up with someone who was way better than me. So they were never at risk. So they could just give me enough pressure, right? For me to grow and get better. So now I look at my relationship with him is she's my sparring partner. She you know, is your sparring partner. Yeah, she's not fighting me because she wants to hurt me. She's fighting with me so we can both 
get better together. And it just, it completely shifts to me now what fighting fear means. When I look at it as she's my sparring partner and I love her for that. I love that. She, and you're there to help each other grow. Yeah. And that's probably also why you don't take it personally, I would suspect. Yeah. And and it's it's fun. I mean, oh, I mean, I, I could keep going on about it, but we we'll save that for another time. But yeah, save it for another time. But can you answer one quick question in a minute? Yep, in a minute. In a minute. So, how do I let go quicker from a partner that isn't right for me out of my fear that I won't meet my forever partner? Uh, okay, that's going to be very hard to answer in a minute. But we'll do a to we'll do a to be continued, but we'll. In one minute, give your first um, answer to that. Okay. What, one of the reasons that, that people find themselves stuck in relationships that they know it, it's not going to take them to their happy ever after is because at the heart of it, a lot of people are suffering from what we call a devaluation conflict, right? Mm -hmm. They just haven't connected with their own value. So when you don't understand your value, then you're prepared to take the scraps in life, whatever anyone's going to throw you. So I always say to people, and I, I learned this a long time ago, listening to Carolyn Mice, uh, she talked about any choice that we make in life that comes from a place of fear is never going to be the right choice. So you're making a choice to stay with someone because of fear, the fear of what might happen if you leave this relationship. Right? So you're never, ever going to have a relationship that you that you deserve, that we all deserve, you know, if you always take the scraps in life and you make choices based on fear. And you stay in something for the fear that you won't meet that forever partner. Yeah. So I always look at this and go, you know, there's, there's, there's two things in life. There's faith and fear that we can navigate life from as, as a compass. Now, faith and fear both have something in common. They both require you to believe in something that hasn't happened yet. Right. So you oh, can, that's beautifully yeah. said, Mark. I love yeah. that. So when I said being an adult is about making choices, you get to choose, right? Do I navigate life from a place of fear or do I choose to navigate life from a place of faith? And here's how it works, right? What you choose to picture, whether it's faith or fear, what you picture, right, you feel and what you feel you become. So if you picture something that's going to end badly, right? which is fear, then you're going to feel fear and fear is disempowerment. That's how it plays out. So it's so important that we start to hold a higher vision for ourselves. And one of the biggest skills that we can practice is two levels of faith, right? Faith in something that's outside of us, that's greater than us and faith in ourselves. And sometimes we need um, mentors or coaches that people that see that and hold that hope for us before we can see it ourselves. So then yeah. we can also realize it ourselves. Absolutely, yeah. And I think one of the biggest roles of a coach for a lot of people is to help hold the higher vision for someone. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause it's, it's very hard when you're in the game, you know, oh. to not get lost in, you yeah. Know, the levels. yeah, to get lost in the game. So a good coach sort of helps hold that, that higher vision. But yeah, I think, um, that, that's that's where I would start. And I'd start to look at the devaluing com conflict that's going on and start stepping into things that would allow us to start changing our relationship with ourselves about how we see ourselves. And just keep asking yourself, just as a as a like a barometer at this stage, right? If I'm making a choice from a place of faith or fear, and if it's coming from a place of fear, right, then go, that's probably not going to be the right choice and start moving in the opposite direction. Okay. It's another thing. I'll share one more tip with you, which is really powerful. It relates to this, you know, because we all have, if you look at what's going on in the world right now, right, there, there's so much fear going on in the world, like so much fear. In fact, they talk about, you know, the news and, and all that just being fear porn, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it is. And there's been a lot of us having to make choices lately about the directions we want to move in, who we should listen to, who we shouldn't listen to. And it gets very, very overwhelming. So, a bit of advice I give people is right, always look whenever you're hearing a message as well, which ties into faith and fear, right? Whenever you're hearing someone speak, just ask yourself this one question. Is what they're saying intended to empower you or disempower you? 
Because if what they're saying has the intention to disempower you and to make you feel helpless and hopeless, right, then don't listen to them, right? Because that's not truth, because truth always has a way of empowering you. So, so yeah, so whenever you're hearing these two conflicting messages coming at you, just take a moment to connect which one's trying to push fear and trying to disempower me with their message versus who's trying to empower me with their message. And truth always aligns with empowerment, so move, move in that direction. So it's the same thing for a relationship. You know, if you're in a relationship with someone, but you're feeling disempowered in that relationship, right, then just know that what you're looking for is never going to be found outside of you with another person. It can only be found inside of you with your relationship with yourself about yourself. So this question really, in a nutshell, isn't about whether you should leave this person or not. It's about whether you want to start a relationship with yourself or not. And I'll leave it at that. And that's a great way to wrap. You just uh, brought it home for us, Mark. All right, fun. Oh, this thank you for having me. This was so fun. This was way longer than either Mark or I actually thought it was going to be. So uh, to be continued, Mark, this was fantastic. Okay. Oh, well, thank you for having me. And for everyone that did tune in for the whole thing, thank you for listening to my very interesting timeline of experiences. But yeah, hopefully there was something in there that you guys could connect with that might help make sense of some of the stuff that's coming up for you right now. And um, yeah, happy to come back and, and keep sharing what I can. It was so many gems in that. I'm going to go back and watch it. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Bye.